Okay, so the next piece is called How You Like Me Now uh, from 1988. Um, and it is not referring to the Toby Keith song. It is an 80s hip-hop song. Let's see. By Kumo D. Okay, so some late 80s rap, hip-hop. Anyway, <clears throat> this is a portrait of the Reverend Jesse Jackson, who most of you won't know who this is, but uh, uh, Jesse Jackson was a confidant and supporter of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He was in Memphis when Dr. King was assassinated. And two different times, in 1984 and in 1988, he ran unsuccessfully for the Democratic National, uh, well, the, the Democratic spot for the president of the United States. Uh, he was a civil rights leader, but he also had some controversy um, with some of his own racist views. So it's by artist David Hammonds. And um, so this is what is said about that. So much of the art that in the past has sparked outrage has been a product of the artist's interpretation of an outrageous period of history. For David Hammonds in 1988, his work was a response to the Civil Rights Movement. Having received a commission from the Washington Project of the Arts to create a piece of work appropriate for their exhibition on black culture and modernism, Hammonds took a central figure of the movement, Jesse Jackson, and manipulated a billboard that was being used for his campaign to feature Jackson as white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, and juxtaposed with the rap slogan, How You Like Me Now. Uh, Reverend Jackson first command, commandeered public attention as a close colleague of Dr. King. He participated in the march from Selma to Montgomery. And he became with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Jackson campaigned for, uh, twice for the presidency becoming the second African-American to mount a nationwide campaign. His campaign policy was strong in the belief of equal rights and the expansion of a welfare state. What is thus so vital about Hammond's controversial work is that he challenges the notion that the color of one's skin can accountably change their politics. He argues that all is very well for a politician to be rooted in the strife for increased defense cuts a system of social welfare and advancement of civil rights on the basis that they are white. So if they were white and asked for those things, it'd be all well and good. But if it's a black person asking for it, well, then they're just looking for a handout. The painting had originally been a billboard located near the National Portrait Gallery in D.C. However, having been attacked with sledgehammers by local African-American youths, who misunderstood and believed that the whitewashing of a black politician was racism, it was then restored to a conventional gallery setting. Many argue that the framing of an icon of black political solidarity with hip-hop graffiti was a way in which Hammond's comments on the disparity between the civil rights generation and the beginnings of the hip-hop generation. Perhaps black leaders such as Jackson himself were prepared to assimilate into a predominantly white government, in which case had their struggles been in vain? Yet Hammond's How You Like Me Now conjures an amalgamation of responses. Some found his portrayal an insult to black political history. Others recognized a pressing statement made by Hammond's, ultimately urging us to defy and combat the prejudice made in politics. So, what is the controversy? Well, he was saying, basically, 
if Jesse was white, blonde haired, and blue eyed, his politics and his thoughts wouldn't be seen as so revolutionary. This next piece is by German artist Otto Dix entitled Trench Warfare and it was made in uh, 1923. I'm sorry I, I transposed the, the date. 1923. Um, no one had seen anything like World War I before. It wasn't anything like any other battles in human history. It was the very first truly mechanized war. Um, and it was a war on a scale that had never been seen. Um, machine guns were invented. Tanks. The use of poisonous gases. Um, all of these things were new and completely and utterly terrifying and most of the men who fought in the Great War, the Forgotten War now, at the, from, you know, 1914 to 1919, um, the, the planet had never seen anything like that. Uh, even the Civil War, the American Civil War, was not as gruesome as this war was. And because of that, it really changed people's perception of humanity and what it was capable of. The Trench, one of Dix's most controversial paintings, was sold to a German museum in 1923, showing decomposing bodies. The painting was a strong indictment of the war. The public was so outraged by the theme of the painting that the museum's director was forced to resign. The outcry over the trench did not dissuade Otto Dix from his feelings or commitment to become even more critical of the war. In 1924, he joined other artists who fought in the First World War to assemble an exhibition of paintings entitled No More War. In that same year, Otto Dix also created a book of etchings, The War, referred to by one critic as perhaps the most powerful as well as the most anti-war statements in modern art. Um, this was the truth. Um, none of this is, is being shown as some fantasy. Um, uh, to the left, you have the soldiers and their helmets walking through clouds of poisonous gas. Uh, it would cause blisters, blindness. It would burn the lungs. You would spit and froth and gasp and finally collapse. If you did survive, you were horribly burned or blinded, many years taken off your life. And the center panel is literally bodies were left on the barbed wire and the pylons outside of a trench, in a literal trench. It was, you know, seven foot deep, maybe sometimes eight or nine feet deep. Um, if you've seen the movie 1917 recently, you can see what the trenches look like. But often, as you see at the bottom center panel, the dead that were recovered from the battlefield were placed under the boards at the bottom of the trench to wait until they could be taken by truck. Uh, and they were rotted. Your, your friend was a, was a bloated dead body in the trench with you. And then to the right is someone trying to help a wounded soldier through the fog in the middle of the either at sunset or sunrise, walking over the dead. So um, these were true depictions, and it really broke an entire generation of people. They called them the lost generation. Um, they were so traumatized by what they saw that when they come back, this was the first time things like what we call post-traumatic stress disorder even existed as a diagnosis, early days of psychology and psychiatry, they called it shell shock, and men would just tremble and couldn't stand or walk. They, their nervous system were just fried, so. Um, and a lot of people took exception to 
this painting being exhibited in a museum or a gallery because it was just too gruesome. And they felt that anybody who said the war was pointless, uh, they felt was being unpatriotic and un, uh, unsupportive of the, the troops. But these were men, these painters, these artists were the troops. They served in the war. Now we jump ahead to the 1950s, and uh, this is a piece by a modern American artist named Robert Rauschenberg. Modernism, of course, you know, everything past the teens of the 20th century is still considered modernism. And then you get up another, you know, 15 or 20 years around now, they call that contemporary. Uh, this is entitled An Erased de Kooning. Um, Willem de Kooning is also an artist. Um, so let's find out what the hell this one's all about. <clears throat> it starts with a story. This is the story that Rauschenberg told. He was nervous, standing in front of Willem de Kooning's house, clutching a bottle of Jack Daniels in one hand. The then 27-year-old artist knocked hesitantly on the door. Don't be home. He silently prayed, but he was home. And after a few awkward moments, I told him what I had in mind. What Rauschenberg wanted to do was to take one of de Kooning's drawings. And that request wasn't a big surprise. Artists from the same circles often traded works. <clears throat> and the two of them were already friendly after meeting at Black Mountain College a year earlier. But the younger artist didn't want to hang the sketch on the wall of his studio. He wanted to erase it. It was a radical request. In 1953, when Rauschenberg arrived on his doorstep, Willem de Kooning was the most celebrated modern artist in New York City. So here you have this kid, Rauschenberg, going up to, you know, somebody he knew, maybe a couple years older, and asking him for a drawing, and he says, I want to erase it. And this guy is currently, he's asking the guy who is currently the most famous modern artist at, in New York. It was a radical request. Other artists admired him for his unparalleled draftsmanship. Collectors were snapping up to Kooning's paintings for unprecedented sums. Quote, I recall the thrill that went through New York art world at the news that a Willem de Kooning painting had just sold for $10,000. So in 19, you know, 51, 52, 53, for an artist who was living and making art right then, to have one of their pieces sell for 10 grand was mind boggling. That was money set aside for the old masters. <clears throat> Now, this was more than most people earned in a year, $10,000. So, when a de Kooning is worth that much, even a throwaway sketch that he, you know, was like, eh, I don't like this, and then had his name on it, he did it, it was still worth money. Um, and then Rauschenberg comes along and figures that was the most logical choice to do something. It had to be something by somebody who everybody agreed was great. And the most logical person for that was Willem de Kooning. Um, so before he went to de Kooning, Rauschenberg had experimented with erasure by wiping out his own drawings. But he, he didn't like that. He's like, it, it was my own work and erasing it would only be half the process. I wanted it to be the whole process. In other words, in his mind... The art was the erasing. Now, Willem de Kooning was a little less than enthused about this. He's like, he says, I remember that the idea of destruction kept coming up into the conversation. And I kept trying to show that it wouldn't be destruction, said Rauschenberg. Although there was always the chance that if it didn't work out, there would be a terrible waste. <laughs> As the younger artist further thought about his intentions and discussed it with several glasses of whiskey, de Kooning was like, okay, 
Okay. I see where you're going with this. But the painter wasn't going to make it easy. So Rauschenberg says, De Kooning pulled out a portfolio and began flipping through all the pages. He'd settle on one and then he'd say, no, it has to be something I'd miss. So De Kooning's starting to take this serious. Now he's half crocked. They're both half crocked. But he's starting to think, okay, if I'm going to give this kid one of my drawings to wipe out, it needs to be something that I like. That way, it has more importance. A lot of conceptual stuff here. A lot of messing with brains. And it's a one-trick pony. You can only do this once and be like, oh, that's crazy. Um, so, he pulled out a second folder, finally landing on a sketch made with a combination of a grease pencil, some ink, some charcoal, and some pencil. Um... Rauschenberg later recalled, he said, I don't even remember what it looked like. Um, what he did remember was how long the process took. It took two months to erase it. And then it wasn't completely erased. He said, I wore out a lot of erasers, so he was very careful. And you could still see the smudges and some of the stains and stuff like that. He couldn't get it all off. <laughs> The result was this thing we're looking at here. And it wasn't until 1955 that Rauschenberg decided to submit to a show, a drawing show, that his buddy was doing. And uh, his friend said, why don't you frame that one? And he, uh, he made a description saying, um, let's see... Oh, I don't have that. Sorry. Um, but anyway, so he submitted it. And it went to the gallery, and nobody really said much. No reviews mentioned it. But it started the story, the artists who went to the gallery opening. The low income, the high income, the beginners, the older guys, older gals. Well, they all hung out. And they'd go to the cafes or whatever, and they'd shoot the shit. And they'd be like, do you see what, what Rauschenberg did with that de Kooning? And he's like, no, no, I didn't go make it to the show. And they'd say, well, he, he took it to Cooning and he erased it. And they framed it. And they started shooting the shit. And they liked the concept of it. So it kind of got word of mouth, got around. And, uh, and then all of a sudden it became this big deal. And it is now considered one of Rauschenberg's most controversial. But at the time, it wasn't considered too scandalous. Uh, much of his work around this time was questioning the nature of art. He was kind of what they call a contrarian, like, eh, you know, well, what is art? You know, what, what do you do? If you, if you frame a blank piece of paper, could you call that art? Because there's an idea, it just hasn't been born yet. Um, things like that. So this is what I was talking about, like, after the World War I... And the horrors of it, and even as far back as the Impressionists and everything, we'd, we'd spent, you know, 300,000 years trying to make things look exactly like our eyes saw them. And then everybody kind of got bored with that, and we're like, well, what else can you do? And then after the war, they're like, you know, painting pretty shit doesn't matter anymore. Who wants to paint flowers? We've seen bellies spilt open. And rotting bodies and poison gas and all those pretty flowers really just don't seem so important anymore. And so these new ideas, pushing and pushing and taking away, stepping back, um, that was the main goal of these guys. It was all brain art more than pretty art. Um, it was made sometimes to pick a fight even. So... Um, and... Uh, Let's see. Where was I? I lost my spot. Hang on. Um, in 1953, another thing he did, he packed a shallow box with soil, lined it with seeds, and hung it on the wall of a gallery. He returned to the exhibition regularly to water his grass painting. What's funny is in 1953, that was considered bizarre. Now we have artists actually making giant wall-sized murals out of different mosses and stuff. And the portrait or the artwork will grow and you'll see it from all the different colored plants. 
Now it's considered a cool thing to do. Um, you know, um, so a lot of these things at this type of idea was, you know, to mess with the idea of what is art and how can you get through it. And eventually, and I may have mentioned this earlier in the semester, um, maybe very early in the semester, but Rauschenberg was the guy who did the white canvases. He would stretch canvas on a stretcher and he would paint it just with white paint. And you could see the brush strokes and stuff and he painted pictures, but it was just white paint on a white canvas. And he would hang those on the gallery. So it was almost as if like it was a, it was a, another push of a joke. And I mean, that's as far as you can take it. Short of having an empty room saying, well, my idea's in there. You just got to find it, you know. And then you're like, okay, ha, 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 you know. Then it becomes almost a, a practical joke. But there is a, a great deal of smart assitude when it comes to art in the early to mid 20th century. <clears throat> this one is called Carry That Weight. It is the mattress performance of Emma Sokowitz. And it went from September 2014 to May 19, 2015, which was her graduation day. <clears throat> um, well, I'll just let the word speak for it. I won't try and, and explain it, but um, a cultural controversy with an unusually long half-life carry that weight, a.k.a. Mattress Girl, at Columbia University in New York, uh, it proved that the category of victim art tends to bring out opinions and emotions from the public that don't normally weigh in on certain matters. Um, the mattress was part of a senior project. Um, and it, it really tore things apart. So... Um, Columbia's commencement on May 19, 2015, Columbia University, um, Emma Sokowitz lugged the twin mattress that she had been carrying around since September after claiming that she was raped in 2012 by a male student. <clears throat> She conceived it as part of her degree. Her project had earned plaudits, cheers from feminists and left-leaning politicians and condemnation from those who saw it as a publicity stunt or a form of harassment and even an outright lie. Um, it also brought legal action from Paul Nungasser, a German student who was at the center of her rape claims. Nungesser was eventually cleared of charges by the university. And he filed a lawsuit against the university and her, saying that they treated him as guilty. Um, the university never involved the police, even though she reported this. So... <clears throat> Um, in 2012, Sokowitz claims that this gentleman, Paul Nungesser, a fellow student at Columbia University, raped her in her dorm room on her twin foam mattress. And that the university didn't really do its due diligence. And, um, and so it was even... You know, she was invited to a State of the Union address. Um, and some people even blamed her advisor, saying he that person came up with it. Um, anyway, they did date. It wasn't, you know, stranger rape. It was date rape. 
uh, Sokolowitz, you know, they had text messages and stuff, and he was saying that, you know, they had consensual sex a number of times, which I'm sure they did, but that doesn't matter. Uh, you also have to remember this is before the Me Too movement. This is before Harvey Weinstein. This is before Louis C.K. This is leading up to that. Um, you know, and then, you know, his lawsuit claimed that he was targeted because he is a male. Um, you know, which nowadays, you're going to, you know, this was the beginning, early stages of fighting the whole stigma of victim blaming. Um, right wing news picked it up and went after him. Uh, Breitbart, Washington Examiner, Alex Jones, Rush Limbaugh. Um, you know, they started accusing her of fake rape and all this other stuff. And um, but anyway, Emma would take this mattress literally everywhere she went. Every single class she attended from September to May, um, to lunch, to dinner, to breakfast, she would carry this mattress to her courses. She carried it to her graduation. If she went shopping, she carried it with her. She was never photographed without it. So there was a strong commitment to the performance she carried now, this wasn't the exact mattress, but it was one identical to the ones that were used in the Columbia University dorms. Um, but the pushback was pretty strong against her, and the pushback was very strong against the accused rapist. And like I said, there was a lot of pushback against the university, and then people began to do investigations, you know, uh, journalists, and where they found that a lot of universities across the country uh, Mizzou was included in this study. Um, they're so large. And they have so many students. They have their own campus, quote, police department. But the campus police department does not fall under the jurisdiction of civil law. It's not until the region's actual, the city's police department gets involved that it could file criminal charges. Campus police can never file criminal charges. The worst that can happen from a campus police investigation is expulsion or they turn it over to the actual law enforcement community. And they found in a lot of university situations, young women were being shuffled aside. Um, one of the biggest ones was, uh, oh, what was his name? Uh, he was a swimmer. Uh, was this Brock Turner? Yeah. Good old Brock Turner. Brock Allen Turner. Um, was caught raping an unconscious female student behind a dumpster at a fraternity party. And he only served three months in jail. And the judges... <laughs> The judge said, well, he's a young man. He was a, a, a professional swimmer going for the Olympics. And why should we just ruin this young man's life? Even though a jury found him guilty. Uh, two other guys beat his ass, knocked him off of the girl, and caught him and held him till the cops came. They witnessed it happening. And he still only got three months. So, uh, yeah. That stuff's not going to fly anymore. Okay? Okay. I think I'm going to stop there because this video might be getting a little long and then I'll do the next section.